Thank you, Ryan. It is a privilege to be here today, uh, this opportunity. Uh, many familiar faces from the community. We've lived here about nine years. Many new faces as well, but the greatest privilege for me is to open God's Word with you. And I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 40 this morning. Isaiah chapter 40, the Old Testament. Thank you so much to the worship team in leading us in some of those scriptures and the songs that reflect on the greatness of God from these chapter, this chapter in Isaiah. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 as we begin. If you have a copy of the scriptures, either in paper or on your phone, And would follow along as I read Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word, your inerrant, inspired, infallible word, I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive it by your spirit, the illumination and conviction and transforming power of God would meet us this morning, and each individual here this morning would leave with truth that transforms By the power of God, we pray this, and for the glory of God, we ask it. Amen. Isaiah 40, first verse, first word, and second word, is a declaration of comfort, of courage, of encouragement. Comfort, comfort, God says. And if you're doing math, as I figured this out this week, Isaiah 40 comes after Isaiah 39. And the comfort here, you know, working with Ryan, Ryan's, of course, the engineer and mathematician and working with Taylor, too, a little bit. You know, I'm not really that good at math. But I can figure this out. And that's important because Isaiah 39 ends in a certain way that Isaiah 40 then comes and meets with comfort and encouragement. Isaiah 39 closes dark and disappointing. We won't look back at it, but let me tell you the, the, the background there. God is challenging and rebuking his people, and King Hezekiah, who had otherwise been a good king, comes to the end of his life and in foolish pride kind of flaunts some of his wealth to neighboring nations, and God says, you know what, those neighboring nations are the ones that I'm going to send to judge you, judge the nation of Israel for your sin. And kind of to cap it off, Hezekiah says, well, as long as things go well during my life, I guess I don't care. And so chapter 39 ends sort of in a disappointment. You could say a, a dunce king and a dark future because there is a promise of God's judgment. Or another way you might think of it is Isaiah 39 is a lot like certain chapters in our own lives because we live in a sin-warped, sin-infected world where there are disappointments, where relationships fail and dreams we might have had don't always materialize and our sin even will take us at times places we didn't want it to go. And our lives are a lot like Isaiah 39 and so into our Isaiah 39 lives Isaiah 40 comes with this word of encouragement, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Comfort and encouragement. Into this situation, there's a a few things just right off the bat in verse 1 and verse 2. First of all, God claims us. He says, my people, your God. And then he comforts. Verse 2 says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. The phrase, speak tenderly, debar alev, speak to the heart. God speaks to the heart of his people in their disappointment. 
in their struggle. And he speaks with comfort. That word comfort, that idea of consolation or encouragement, is God coming, moving toward the hearts of his children to heal our pain, to dry our tears, to calm our fears, and to restore our joy. Think of a parent when a child scrapes their knee or maybe is afraid in the night. The the parent goes to the child. There's a a comfort and an encouragement there. And God, like like a parent, in our pain, he comes to us. He comes to bring his comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 says that God is the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So we set this up and we see God entering into this situation with comfort and encouragement. That's his stated purpose. But the question then is, so how does God do that? What's the the technique or what means does he use to bring comfort and encouragement into our dark places, into our challenges and difficulties? I'm glad to have my family with me this morning, our four kiddos. Our youngest, Clara, is over there. And Clara, when she gets a scrape or a bang or a nick or a cut, you know, there's, there's tears, but then a Band-Aid can fix it. Right, Clara? Does a Band-Aid fix it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, especially if it's a pretty Band-Aid. But as we live longer, we all recognize and we all experience That there are wounds of body and soul that a Band-Aid can't fix. In fact, we sometimes say of superficial encouragement. That's just putting a Band-Aid on it, right? So how does God comfort? Well, he doesn't put a Band-Aid on it. Instead, as we look at our text this morning, we see some some out unrolling of of the ways in which God comforts. And I'm just going to share two this morning, two big ways, and then we'll look at some sort of points under that. You might have an outline in your bulletin. If you want to follow along, you're welcome to do that. If you want to just listen, that's, that's fine too. God comforts us by inviting us into a deeper awareness of his unwavering promises and his unrivaled power. And Isaiah just develops that here in chapter 40. And so look with me first at these promises as they unfold here in the first half of this chapter. First promise, God delights to comfort with the promise of forgiveness. Look down at verse 2. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, cry to her, her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That word double for all her sins has the idea of something that, that is folded. And when you fold something, if you fold a piece of paper, the two sides match then. What he's saying is, for all Israel's sin, God had a matching forgiveness, a matching grace. He says her iniquity is pardoned. Now, judgment will come. Isaiah 39 says, Babylonia will come. Judgment will come on Israel for her sin. But on the far side of that judgment, God promises there is a word of mercy and forgiveness for the repentant. And that is extraordinary comfort. The fact that God can forgive, and here as we are on this side of the New Testament, the reality that God can forgive because of Jesus, because Jesus died on the cross and took our punishment, we don't have to. That is an extraordinary comfort. And God wants to comfort us with the promise of forgiveness, just like he comforted here in Isaiah 40. There's another comfort in the promises of God. And second on your outline, God delights to comfort with a promise of presence. His presence. Look down at verse 3 and 4. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain shall be made low. That an even ground shall become level. The rough places, a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
What's he saying? He's saying this. God is carving a four-lane interstate highway through the mountains and the valleys of our lives so that he can come and be with us, be near us. That's the point of his forgiveness, that we can dwell in relationship again. And this, this verse, these verses lay that out. God's desire to be with his people. Of course, in the New Testament, again, these verses became John the Baptist's cry, right? Because he was preparing the way for God with us, Emmanuel, to be with us. God delights to comfort with this promise of his presence. And I think of Jesus saying, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a standing invitation. And I would just ask, I would just say, have you received, have you acted on that invitation? Have you come in humbly confessing your sin and seeking his forgiveness and then being with him in living fellowship in the promise of his presence? There's a third comfort here. God delights to comfort with the promise of his trustworthiness. Look down at verses 6, 7, and 8. It's familiar words. It's about the flesh, humanity being like grass. It sprouts up in the spring. Here we are in spring in Kansas. Everything's growing. We know in August it's all going to, you know, it's all going to wilt and go brown. Well, hopefully not. But there's the reality. Grass grows and it withers. We as human beings are here today, gone tomorrow. God is here today and here tomorrow. Look at verse 8. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. That's why the promises of God are not a band-aid. They're reality. Because his word is true and it stays true. He is trustworthy. And so God comes to his people in Isaiah 40 and and lays out these promises, forgiveness, presence, trustworthiness. And he begins to develop the case for comfort. But he doesn't stop there. The other day I went to to Wichita to do a little shopping. And I've never done this before, but I forgot my wallet at home. So here I am in Wichita and I have a, a cart with some stuff in it. And I just so happened to bring my checkbook with me. I don't know. You know what those are? Checkbooks? Little things, right? The cashier didn't really know what it was either. And so I'm here trying to say, okay, what do I need to do? Can I use this checkbook? Well, you know, you need your ID. Well, that's in the wallet back at home. Don't tell the cops on the way home. Um, So I I had my wife take a picture of my ID, my driver's license, and I I showed it to the cashier, and I showed it to another cashier, and I showed it to the third cashier. And finally, I was able to get a few things with my check. You think about that. I I don't really blame them because you think about a piece of paper, a little piece of paper with some squiggles on it. It isn't really much to go on. You know, sometimes I think we can approach God's word. You know, here's a piece of paper. Here's some pieces of paper with some squiggles on them. But what backs it up? What's the money in the bank, so to speak, that gives us confidence that these words have power and reality in our life. Well, Isaiah now in verse 9 is going to kind of open the bank vault door and show us the money in the bank as we look at the unrivaled power of God. So here are the promises in the first section, and here's the power that lays beneath those promises. Look at verse 9. This is kind of the transitional, these three verses. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Take a look at your God. See your God. Open your eyes. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. And his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before for him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Behold your God. Look at your God. Look at the 
the money in the bank because he is a God of power and there is no rival. When I came to Kansas from Minnesota, the great state of Minnesota, back in 2013, we moved down here. I had to get a little bit acquainted with the KU, K-State rivalry. I always thought college, what's college sports? But I guess down here it's a big deal. A rivalry is a, a competition, it's a quest for dominance that goes back and forth sometimes over the years. Or depending on your team, maybe sometimes it just goes back or whatever. But it, it's two, you know, the, the rivalry exists where there are two closely matched teams. Think about that. There is no rivalry between, say, the Kansas City Royals and, and your child's t-ball team, okay? There's no rivalry there. And Isaiah 40 is going to tell us there is no rivalry between God and all that he has created. As great as it may seem to us, as important as it may seem to us, there is no rivalry. There are four aspects that Isaiah explores here. Number one, God delights in his unrivaled immensity. Look down at verse 12. Who has measured the waters? The waters, plural, every drop of water. The oceans, the rivers, the aquifers, the lakes, the 10,000 lakes, and all the rest. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens with a span. Span is from your thumb to your pinky. Your span. Who has done that? Who has, who has gone from this side of the universe to the 28 billion light years over here to this side of the universe with a, with a thumb and a forefinger? Who has enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has done that? There's only one. Your God. Think of the oceans. Think of the seas. You know, we have a book in the house about the oceans and you see the surface of the ocean, vast, but you go down and it's vaster. And you go down and there's no sun. You go down and there's, there's strange things down there. And God made it and God holds it in the palm of his hand. God's being and immensity dwarfs everything else imaginable. There is no rival. Psalm 71, 19. Your righteousness, O God, reaches to the high heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? That's a rhetorical question because the answer is known. Nobody. In fact, some of you might have the name Michael, that Hebrew word, Michael. Who? Me? It's that, that interrogative. Who is like El? God. Who is like God? Answer, no one. He has no rivals in his immensity. He has, number two, no rivals for his wisdom. God delights in his unrivaled wisdom. Verse 13 and 14. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Who has, uh, or what man shows him his counsel? So God measures the universe with his fingers. Who has measured God? Verse 14. Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge or showed him the way of understanding? You ever talk to someone about a topic, and as you talk to them, you realize that they had an understanding that was above you? I'm, I'm sure, talk to enough people long enough, you, you find plenty of people who understand certain rea aspects, maybe of science or math or, or other things that's above you. Isaiah says God is above us in every way, in every topic, in every subject of knowledge, he is at another level entirely. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, God's speaking here, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then Paul cries out in Romans eleven thirty three, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the knowledge and wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable 
his ways. Inscrutable, I like that word. Unable to even penetrate to the heart of his wisdom. Can't be searched out or scruted out, whatever that is. God's wisdom and knowledge is vast. Like the way that author A.W. Tozer puts it, he says, God knows instantly and effortlessly all matter and every matter. All mind and every mind, all spirit and all spirits, all being and every being. He never discovers anything. He never is surprised, never amazed, never wonders about anything. Behold your God. This is your God. Unrivaled immensity, unrivaled wisdom. Number three, God delights in his unrivaled authority. There's two sections here that kind of emphasize this theme. Verses 15 through 17 and then verse 21 through 23. We'll look briefly at these. Verse 15 says, Behold, the nations are like a drop in the bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. Take a book off the shelf sometimes if you don't read it too much and you blow across the top and there goes that dust. God says, the nations are like that to me. The nations, plural, every last one of them. They're like a dust, like a drop. Lebanon, verse 16, would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as before him, excuse me, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Look down at verse 21, similar theme. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Who brings princes to nothing and make the, makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. In Genesis chapter 1, when God first made everything, it starts off saying the world was formless and void. Some of you maybe know the word tohu vabohu. That's that Hebrew idea of formless and void, empty. The word here of the nations in verse 23, emptiness is tohu. All of the nations stacked on top of each other. All of the princes and dictators and prime ministers and whatever else stacked on top of each other are to the Lord as a drop, dust, emptiness. You know, I think of times when the headlines start to get me a little nervous. We read of this ruler doing that or this guy doing this or this guy doing that. And we get a little bit antsy or we have an opinion, a strong opinion, and we, we, we can let that sort of steal our peace, can't we? And God says, all princes and presidents are, more, are, are less than a leaky faucet to our God. God is unrivaled in his authority, no rivals. Fourth and last, God is unrivaled in his worth. God delights in his unrivaled worth. Going back to verse 18, it says, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it. A goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Isaiah loves to poke fun at idols. There are other chapters that go into this in depth. But here, just in a little, a little snapshot, he says, this is what you're going to worship? This is what you're going to find your value in? Stuff? Gold? Silver? Cars? Houses? Land? cattle, whatever, that's your value? God is unrivaled in his superiority over these things. Look down at verse 25. Again, the same question. Who then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? 
Lift up your eyes and see who created these. Who created the silver and the gold and the cattle and the hills and, and all of it? Who created these? Lift up your eyes to the stars, he's referring. Who created these? Who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might? And because he is strong in power, not one of them is missing. The reason the stars come out at night is because God is a God of power. God has promises that are unwavering. He has a power that is unrivaled. What does that mean for us? How does that bring comfort into our lives? In the last just few verses, Isaiah gives us two challenges, two encouragements. You have a great and awesome God. Behold your God, he says. And then he brings it down to the just very practical application level. I'm going to share just two practical realities for us because we have a great, great God. Number one, the God who sees all sees you. Verse 27, as he comes to the end of this just incredible display of God's immensity and authority and power, he encounters, he, he challenges Israel with this question, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? You ever been there? You ever felt forgotten? Why is God letting this happen? Where is God? Is, does God really care in this situation, in this circumstance? That's what they're asking. And God is gently coming back and saying, wait a minute. I created this. I sustained this. I see you. I care for you. So take courage. The God who sees all sees you this morning. Number two, the God of all strength will give you strength. Verse 29, he gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The youths and the young men are, from a human perspective, the strong ones. You know, they're in the prime of life. They're, they're chosen. They're, they're running the races. They're fighting the wars. But God says, what looks like the prime of life in human strength still isn't enough. Even the youths and the young men, they, they get exhausted in human strength. They, they wear out and, and run down. But the God of power and the God who does not faint and the God who does not grow weary gives his strength to those who maybe aren't strong outwardly, but who wait and trust in him. When we are willing to admit our weakness, God gives his strength. Paul put it this way. He said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because when we're weak, God gives his strength. In verse 31, I love the progression. It's a little bit backwards almost to us. He talks about soaring like eagles, then, then running, maybe like a champion would run, and then, and then just walking. You know, preach better the other way around. You could get some momentum there. You know, you walk, and then you, then you run, and then you're soaring. But I think there's a reason Isaiah does it this way. Because as much as we might like to soar with the eagles or run with the champions, oftentimes the thing we need the most is the strength to just put one foot in front of the other as we walk with the Lord. And he gives strength for that. There at a walking pace, God gives his strength to those who wait. 
That is, who rely and trust those who stake their hope and happiness on this God, this God of unwavering promises and unrivaled power. They who wait on this God shall renew their strength because, not because of them, but because he is a great and awesome God. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray that you would bring the comfort and encouragement of Isaiah 40 home to us. Father, for those this morning that need strength, which in one way or other is all of us, help us to behold our God, to see him as he truly is in his greatness and power, and trustworthiness, and love, and forgiveness, and presence. And Father, may that put a little spring in our step this morning, a little stiffener in our backbone, that we may go as children of the King, the infinitely great King. I pray this in Christ's name for His glory. Amen.